All right. Oh, I've got one more to let in here <laughs> or three. All right, while we're, these last folks are joining, I just want to say welcome. My name's Angela Nevin and I'm the Director of Training for the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. I'm the, um, I'm the driver behind this today, so I'll be uh, handling your questions and whatnot. Um, a couple things, we ask you to please leave your camera off as we have a fairly large group and that can stress the bandwidth at times. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the chat and we will, um, I'll pull them up and we can either answer them if it's necessary at the time or we'll hold them for a Q and A at the end. Um, the uh, last piece, just to let you know, is that in the chat is a link for part two. This is part one only of a two part session. Part two will be next month but you have to register for them separately. So I've put that in the chat and we'll put that in there at the end as well. Uh, last but not least, if you aren't already a member of CCDC, we encourage you to do so. Um, and we will give you that information towards the end as well. I think that's all my housekeeping. Let's give that to Brenda here. Mm -hmm. Did we lose Brenda? There she is. Uh, oh, I tell you, technology, aren't we just all so proud? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Angela, for that housekeeping and keeping us all on task. And my name is Brenda Mosby, and I am the owner and operator of Mosby Services. And one of the services that we offer is employment for people with disabilities. And I've been doing this for over 20 years. It is my passion. It's what I'd love to do. I've actually written a book called You Are Capable, because I know that having a disability does not mean that you do can have a job. And I want to, we want to give um, Chantel as much time as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Dawn, who is going to introduce her herself. She is my, my partner and cohort as Angela and, and others. And I have been so proud to be working with the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. And I have been a member with this organization for years and it has been so beneficial. So I hope all of you will consider um, joining us so that we can be be a powerhouse uh, voice all together. With that, Dawn, I want to turn it over to you. Hi, thank you for join, joining us this morning. I'm the director of community organizing um, for CCDC. I, um, and, and it's my pleasure to Introduce Chantel Rockman, who is the executive director of Integrating Supports of Colorado. She is at CP WIC and um, and the executive director again. Um, and Integrating Supports provides benefits planning and supported employment for people with disabilities here in Colorado. So thank you, Chantel, for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you, Don, for that. And good morning, everybody. Um, I recognize a handful of you on the call today. So um, I'm excited to be presenting both this um, presentation this morning, as well as the second part, which will be uh, next month. Um, and also just want to thank CCDC for asking me to be a part of this series. It's a, um, a very important um, piece of information that needs to get out to those with disabilities who are receiving cash benefits and are who are wanting to either go back to work or who are um, currently working. So with that said, let's just jump right in. So you can see here um, an iceberg. Um, I'm sure everybody has heard myths that I can only work 20 hours a week. Well, um, unfortunately that is incorrect. And that is just the tip of the iceberg, but 
Um, as we know, as an iceberg forms, um, the larger piece of that iceberg is below the water and sometimes things that we can't see or behind the scenes. Um, so what that is and what that means is you have potential for in increased income, um, benefits planning services. There's the ticket to work program. There's work incentives, um, which work incentives is what we are going to touch on the second part of the series next month. As well, inside of those work incentives, there's the trial work period, there's a pass plan, there's your Medicaid, Medicare extended eligibility, um, student earned income exclusion, subsidy and special conditions. There's ABLE accounts, special needs trust, impairment related work expenses, and then your expedited reinstatement. That all equals self-sufficiency, which is our ultimate goal when we are doing benefits planning is we want to get individuals to where they are self-sufficient and financially stable. As we all know, um, people living on disability keeps them in poverty. Um, that is a very known, known fact. Um, so it is our goal is to be able to provide them with informed choices and the information they need to become self-sufficient. So on top of the water, you see um, an employment support professional. So that is an individual that is um, a certified um, benefits planner, a CPWIC, which stands for Community Partner Work Incentive Coordinator. Um, and that is what um, my agency provides. And it always pays to work. Um, there's never going to be a scenario where um, you are gonna be just financially okay staying and receiving cash disability benefits. So it always pays to work. And then also we have the connection to resources um, that individuals may need. So we are on the um, bottom of the water underneath doing scuba diving as this is an, um, I love this, this picture and this analogies because I'm a scuba diver as well. So this kind of fits me well. So the learning objectives for today is, again, always pays to work. There are many, many common myths surrounding benefits and work, and they often deter people from achieving that self-sufficiency. Um, benefits counseling, what is it and why? And then the types of public benefits. And then again, the social security work incentives that we will touch on on the second part of the series. And then how to access benefits counseling for your participants. So this is my warning or my disclaimer um, that only a certified benefits counselor should provide information on how Social Security cash and medical benefits are specifically impacted by work. Um, this session is not designed to give you, um, it's just designed, excuse me, to give you that basic knowledge about a benefits counselor's work. This is not a benefits counseling certification course. Um, if you are at all interested in wanting to know about that, I will cover that in the second part of the series. So what are benefits? So benefits are a government funded program that are provided to people based on characteristics such as a disability or financial need. Examples of benefits include um, supplemental security income, which is also referred to as SSI, and Social Security Disability Insurance, which is referred to as SSDI. There's your local and public assistance benefits, such as energy assistance, temporary assistance for needy families, or TANF, and then aid to needy disabled, and then supplemental nutrition assistance program, which is referred to as SNAP or food stamps. There's also housing assistance, whoopsies, um, housing assistance, health insurance, which is the Medicaid and Medicare, and other assistance. So what is benefits counseling and what is it all about? So benefits counseling is really a service that helps individuals and with disabilities and their families navigate how employment and other life decisions will impact those cash benefits. Benefits counseling provides a very clear and personalized plan uh, to educate individuals with disabilities and their families that in general, you will not immediately lose your cash benefits and health insurance. 
That plan is also known as a BSNA. Um, so after we get all reports from Social Security, we write this very, very clear and specific report for each individual. And it is specifically designed for their, their need and their benefits that they are currently. Benefits counseling addresses a lot of really fears and concerns that many individuals and their families have about the reduction in benefits if they start working. Benefits counseling helps individuals understand what benefits the individual receives and why. Um, I get a lot of when I'm asking questions about benefits, um, I'm asking, you know, well, what are you receiving? And the, the response typically is, I'm not really sure. I just know I get a check either on the first or the third of the month. Um, so it really kind of dives in to explain um, those individual benefits. Work incentives available when they go to work. Um, and how earned in, income impacts cash benefits public assistance and health insurance. And then also the reporting requirements for each benefit and public assistance program. Um, you have to report wages um, every month to Social Security. And then also how to save money and build assets for self-sufficiency. People will say, well, I'm just receiving X amount of dollars and I wanna be able to save. Well, there's plans put in place. It's um, one of them is called an ABLE account, which is achieving better life experience, um, as well as some special needs trust. When to seek a benefit counselor's assistance. Prior to seeking employment or education. So if you are working with an individual that is just inquiring about going back to work, um, or education, it's best to seek that assistance right up front. Um, also while conducting a job search, when working with Division of Vocational Rehabilitation or their DVR counselor and obtaining employment. Currently working and changes occur. There's transition age students. So if you're working with the students that are ages 14 to 24, and then again, anytime employment is being considered, is when to seek that benefit counselor's assistant. What happens if I work? So these are things that I hear all the time and I'm sure you guys are hearing these same things if you're working with, with clients is I'll lose my SSDI or my SSI. Will I lose my medical insurance? Medical insurance is extremely important. And I hear a lot of people when I'm talking with folks and doing benefits counseling is, I am not all that concerned about necessarily losing my cash benefits. It's losing my medical insurance is more important. Um, and then if you have individuals that are receiving any waiver services, will I lose those services? Will my rent be increased? And will I have less money to live? And what if the job doesn't work out, then what? Who else may have concerns? Families and caregivers, it's not just the individual that's being impacted. Um, families, caregivers, case managers, residential supports, um, if you, they have a rep payee, they're going to want to know. And then anyone else about the financial well-being of the participant. I always encourage um, individuals when I am meeting them to, especially when I do the very first call, which is the intake, um, to invite anybody else who has um, concerns about how this will work or just want that general knowledge. I think it's really important that everybody be on the same page. Have you heard these? I can only work part-time or I'll lose my benefits. If I work less than 20 hours, my benefits will not be affected. If I work, I will lose my medical benefits. I don't have to report income to Social Security. My job does this. I can only, only earn $1,000 per month. If I work, I'll have less money. Or if I lose my benefits, it takes forever to get them back. These are all myths. Um, these are very common out in the working world today with people with disabilities. But again, trying to break through that, that myth of all of these is it can sometimes be a little challenging because we have just been inundated with false information. So today as Social Security benefits, there are two types. There's non-disability related and then there's disability related. 
Those non-disability related ones are retirement benefits or survivor benefits. But we are gonna focus on the disability related, which is SSDI or Social Security Disability Insurance and SSI, Supplemental Security Income for Adults and Children. Disability is always on Social Security's terms. Individuals applying for Social Security disability benefits must prove their disability is severe enough and it impacts the ability to work. There is the Social Security, what is called a blue book. They put out both a blue book and a red book every year. And this blue book is a book of disabilities and it lists all qualifying disabilities. There's extremely strict definitions. There is no partially disabled status. And then there's different guidelines for both adults and children. And Social Security is the one who determines which benefit a person will receive. The definition of Social Security uh, disability, you must meet all three of these criteria. You must be able to, must be unable to engage in substantial gainful activity or also referred to as SGA. Um, and that changes every single year. It increases every single year. And this year, that amount is $1,310. Um, you must have a medically determined physical or mental impairment. And that impairment is expected to last for more than 12 months or result in death. If an individual has statutory blindness, doesn't have to meet that SGA test. And Social Security recipients are subjected to medical reviews. SSI and SSDI benefits. They are two very, very different uh, programs with very different rules. Um, to receive either benefit, the individual must be disabled per, again, that Social Security definition. And type of disability doesn't determine which benefit is received. It's determined by entitlement and eligibility criteria. So Social Security Disability Insurance, or also referred to as Title II, you'll hear those two interchangeable. Um, SSDI, the individual has paid enough into the system on their own work record, and they're disabled per SSA. Um, that first one, individual has paid enough into the system, is if you have worked, you have a past work history and you've paid enough um, FICA tax into the social security system. So if you would look on an individual's pay stub or even your pay stub, there is gonna be a line that says FICA tax. That is the tax that um, you are paying into the system. And then those funds, if you are receiving SSDI are paid back out of. So you are essentially just getting the money back that you put into this fund. Um, childhood disability benefit is an individual is disabled before the age of 22 and is unmarried and have parents that are retired, disabled, deceased, and had enough work credits. And then you're 18 years old and disabled again per Social Security. Disabled widower's benefit. This is an individual who is over 50. The spouse is deceased and had enough work credits and again, disabled per Social Security. Social Security Disability Insurance. It is an entitlement program. The benefit amounts vary based on what the wage earner has paid into, again, that FICA tax. And this can vary between receiving $100 and $2,600 per month. Um, I have seen it go over the $2,600 a month on a couple of occasions. With SSDI, there is absolutely no resource limit. Um, that comes with SSI, which we will talk about. And Social Security counts work earnings in the month it was actually earned, the pay period that is shown on the pay stubs. This is paid on the third of the month or the second, third, or fourth Wednesday of the month based on your birth date. SSDI and Medicare. After a 24 month waiting period, an individual will be automatically enrolled in Medicare. So you've received your social security benefits on April 1 of 2021, April 1, two years later, 20, 
2023, your Medicare should kick in automatically. Part A is free and mandatory. Um, that is paid by uh, the federal government. Part B, some participants may will have to pay for it, which um, this year, oh, I apologize, I forgot to change my year. This year, it's $148.50. This too changes every year because that's the premium for your Medicare payment. Part C is optional and that help covers what Part B does not. And Part D is also optional and that's for prescription coverage. Individuals can receive financial assistance for Part B and D if their income limit is below specific limits. SSI, Supplemental Security Income, this is a needs-based program and it is administered by Social Security. And Social Security looks at the living situation and other income. So if you are receiving SSI, um, it is because you do not have enough work credits paid into the system. And therefore, Social Security is gonna look at your in monthly income, where SSDI, they do not look at that monthly income. The resource limit, is $2,000 for individuals. And for married couples, both on SSI, that is $3,000. So at the end of the month, Social Security looks um, to see what those resources are. And if you are over that either $2,000 or $3,000, uh, that could mean that your um, benefits will cease. Not necessarily terminate, but they will just cease. Um, Social Security counts income when it's received not always the pay period that is shown on the pay stubs. And again, SSI is paid on the first of the month. Continuing on with SSI, federal benefit rate um, of $594 per month in 2021. This changes every year. Last year it was 784 and can be reduced due to living situation not paying rent or their share of living cost. Um, so if it is is low below that $794, um, it's because you're probably not showing that you have um, expenses. An SSI can be low as $522. And again, that's based on the living situation. Some states, but not all, give a state supplement. SSI is specifically intended for food and shelter costs. SSI and Medicaid. Individuals receiving Social Security are automatically eligible for Medicaid. And it is, you're eligible through the Health First Colorado, that's our state's Medicaid system. And it is administered through Healthcare Policy and Financing or also known as HICPUF. There's no waiting period, and there's no monthly premium cost to the individual. And current beneficiaries, this is an individual who is receiving both SSDI and SSI. Um, they'll receive their SSI on the first of the month and their SSDI on the third of the month. This individual receives um, SSDI that is below $803 and have other limited income and resources to qualify for SSI. So that max cash benefit a concurrent beneficiary can receive is $803 from a combination of both. So the example would be if the individual is receiving the SSD, SSDI is $500, then their SSI will be 303, not to go over that max of 803. And they must follow the Social Security rules for both programs. I can only work 20 hours is a myth based on substantial gainful activity, also known as SGA. This is um, a determination that is done again every year. So substantial gainful activity, also known as SGA. In 2021, SGA is $1,310 per month of countable earnings for non-blind individuals. Um, 2021 SGA is $2,190 per month of countable earnings for individuals with statutory blindness. Some of you are probably thinking, well, why is that different? Shouldn't they be the same? Um, 
for those individuals who are statutory blind or any blindness for that matter of fact, the reason why their amount and they get a little bit more is they have an amazing advocacy group in DC. So they have people out there all the time pounding the pavement for the um, blind institution. So, you know, it'd be nice to have individuals out there pounding the pavement for those with other disabilities, but their advocacy group and lobbying groups are much, much larger and they have a much larger impact. So counted earnings over SGA will over time lead to de benefit determination. A decision, it's the decision, it's not just a number. So I'll get asked oftentimes, well, what's the dollar amount or, or what's the number for SGA? You gotta keep in mind, it is a decision and every year, Social Security releases a new SGA figure, and that's based off the cost of living increase. In 2019, for example, it was $1,220. Earnings above SGA does not mean that benefits will automatically terminate. Let's look at why. If you are receiving SSDI, there is what is called a trial work period. And those individuals that you may be working with may have a ticket to work. So they are gonna fall in this category. It is nine months when a recipient will keep full benefits regardless of earnings. So this is the time period where I encourage clients to work as much as you want, make as much as you want, because you'll be able to keep full benefits regardless of those earnings. That nine month trial period, um, it can be used in a, five year rolling time frame or 60 months. Um, Social Security only counts months when earnings are above the threshold. That threshold for this year for 2021 is $940. As you can see in 2005, it was only $590. So that increases every year as well. And so as long as you um, are below that threshold of $940, your trial work periods um, don't count. It's just when you exceed that $940 a month that Social Security then says you have utilized one month or your first month of the trial work period. Once a trial work period is over, it is over. Um, a new trial work period cannot be assessed um, if benefits terminate and start again. So here is just an example of um, the worksheet that we use um, at Integrating Supports. It's, you can see the TWP, which is a trial work period um, right here, $940 for this year. So in this um, scenario, in last year of 2020, the individual was receiving um, income from his employer of $1,045. Well, what that did is that triggered their first trial work period month and so on. You can see through March, April, May, June, um, they were over $910 in 2020. So that triggered the first four. But then what happened here in the month of July and August, maybe that individual was laid off um, for those three months so didn't have an income. Well, Social Security is not going to count anything if there's not income to count um, or if it is below the TWP. So these three months um, were not counted so that individual could still <clears throat> receive benefits. Keep in mind that individual is also still receiving full benefits even through these first four months. Um, and then in October, November, December, they went back to work, but they were still below that $910 or the trial work period. So again, it did not trigger Social Security to count those months as trial work period. So you can see how this can go on for five, five years or 60 months. Um, in the year 2021, that individual started making $1,045. Well, it is over trial work period. So again, that's gonna start triggering those trial work period months. So you can see here in November of 2021, 
their trial work period will end, but then it goes into what is called a cessation grace period. Um, you get one grace or two grace periods, excuse me. After that trial work period, um, you go into a period what is called EPE, Extended Period of Eligibility. Um, and this is 36 consecutive months after the trial work period has been completed. Your Social Security checks, checks to see if countable earnings are over or under SGA a month. So here's when I really tell clients, this is really where the rubber meets the road. And Social Security is going to start looking at that SGA, that substantial gainful activity. If over SGA, that next month, you are not going to receive your SSDI payment. If you're under SGA, you will continue to receive full SSDI payment. During this period, it cannot be terminated from benefits during this time. Again, keep in mind you are in this period for three years or 36 months. Three consecutive months, there's a cessation month as you saw on that example and grace period it happens when the individual reaches SGA or after the trial work period. So that may happen right after the trial work period or it may happen um, in their EPE some period of time. It can be an inside that extended period of eligibility or even after. Individual receive their cash benefits during these three months regardless of earnings. So if you ended your, you had your ninth trial work period month and you started your cessation in grace one and grace two, you are gonna receive those full benefits. If your, um, you use this period during your EPE or even later, those three months you will receive your full benefits. Termination of SSVI. So an individual must have used their entire trial work period. So that could be up to five years. They must have used that extended period of eligibility, which is also known as EPE, and that is for three years, and then have cessation and grace period. You have to have one more month of countable earnings over SGA. If benefits do terminate, there is another protection that is put into place, and we're gonna talk more about that later. If somebody is earning near SGA, we can reduce their countable income with work incentives. Um, the SSDI work incentives can be used when an individual's earnings are close to or over SGA past the trial work period. Work incentives can be used to reduce countable income to below SGA so individuals can keep those benefits. Again, like I said earlier, that's the subsidy, special conditions, impairment related work expense, unsuccessful work attempt, and income averaging. So I am going to actually stop here and I'm gonna open it up for questions and answers because these work incentives is what we will really dive into on our next session, which is next month. So Ange, um, have you had any questions in the chat? Yes, I have a couple actually. Okay. Um, Marilyn, if you want to um, go ahead and unmute yourself and I'll let you ask your question. She's asking about adult disabled child benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and she also wanted to know, is this a government service? Do people pay you for it? How, how is this, how does that work? And I okay. thought, I don't know, it's a good question. They're very good questions. Go ahead, Marilyn. Yeah, I'm trying to, I don't have my video, but I have, can you hear me okay? Then I'll go ahead. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Fine. Yeah, my son actually, uh, I, I am getting social security now and he has been, he has had SSI for about five or six years. He's on a comp waiver. He has fetal alcohol syndrome. He's, so he's developmentally disabled. And actually we had to go to a lawsuit, but we look like we're gonna get adult disabled child for him. So I just wonder what about that? And I think a lot of people, it's not ever mentioned, but a lot of people are gonna end up in social security and these, their disabled children will then qualify for adult disabled child. 
the main reason I want to get this, my son complains so much that he doesn't get to keep all his pay because they reduce his SSI amount. I have to still cover his room and board to his provider. So now he'll get to keep more of his money is my understanding. But can you address, are you going to address that at all as another type of benefit? Um, I can briefly touch on that, yes. Um, so he should be, well, he will be able to receive um, SSI based off of your record. But then what happens is then he will also have his own record. And sometimes that can be a little confusing when I tell people, clients, that you may not only have your beneficiary record, but you also may be receiving benefits from, um, you know, a deceased parent's record and things like that. Um, so he will be able to then um, receive the full Social Security benefit amount. Um, if he does not receive that full SSI amount, um, it is because you guys are not showing enough expenses. The one thing that I encourage um, my SSI parents, if they have a child that's living with them, um, and is receiving SSI is to actually charge that individual rent um, because then what happens is Social Security then sees that that child um, has living expenses. So then um, you can use that living expenses and then we can get his SSI increased back up to that full benefit amount. So, and, and my son lives in a host home. Okay. Um, I should have said that to begin with. No, that's okay. But is it still called SSI when it's adult disabled child? It is. it is, oh, it's still it is. It's SSI. It is, it, it is. And that is very confusing as well because a lot of people will say, I don't have a child, right? Or my child is X age. Um, if they are receiving um, benefits off another record, it is referred to as disabled child. I know it, it's, it's very frustrating to kind of understand that difference, but it, it truly is any, any individual receiving money off another record then still be called disabled child benefit. Oh, but it's still SSI. Well, that's- It's still SSI. Yep. Yeah. 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 And we you're... have to fight to get it because he was diagnosed at age 23, but- um... I believe it. I believe it. And your other question was, um, how do you pay for these services? I'm, I missed your introduction, so I'm not sure what your position is and with whom. Thanks. So um, I'm the executive director here at an agency called Integrating Supports Colorado. And we are a vendor for DBR. So DBR is our primary funding source, as well as our other funding source we have is private pay. And so if you are currently, or your son or daughter, whoever it is, if they are working with DVR, and I noticed there are a couple DVR counselors on this call today. Um, so you would have that conversation with your DVR counselor of, hey, my, my son or daughter is interested in going back to work. Um, you know, they'll kind of set you up. And then what happens is then they reach out to, um, to me with a referral, and then you and I work together on doing benefits planning and you know, providing all of those resources to you. Um, again, the other way is private pay. If you have a son or daughter or family member and you're not going through DVR, um, but you want to receive these services, we can do private pay. Thank you, that, that really helps, thanks. Sure, sure. Okay, um, Jose had a couple questions. Did you, Jose, do you wanna ask those or did you get more of your answer already? Sure, I do. I do want to ask. All right. Uh, because first you were saying something about the difference between SSI and SSDI. I kind of got what you're saying. Uh, there is, I guess my first question is, I understand there are two or three types of SSI, SSDI as well. Uh, and the one I have is interesting. I got it because 
I wasn't eligible for 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 any benefits yet. My mom, my mom became a citizen of the United States, and she got asked if she had a kid with disability, uh, and she said yes. And so she was uh, she was told that I was eligible for SSDI, and that's how they call it SSDI, and it was a really small amount. And ever since I had it. However, in 2016, I I started my SDA went up a lot by a lot, and I mean a lot. Uh, and that was a decision that my boss and I took, uh, considering that Colorado is a Medicaid buying uh, state, right? Correct. So we knew that we had nine months or so. Uh, as a fail safe, just in case something didn't work, I could, uh, you know, ask CCDC to give me back just my capped income. Mm -hmm. uh, so, is this, so my first question, I guess, is SSI or SSDI when you get it from your parent because your parent is a citizen and whatever, whatever. So oh, good, great question. And by the way, hi, Jose. Um, yeah, hi. So SSI is needs-based. We have to keep that in mind that so SSI is needs-based and SSDI is based on entitlement because SSI typically means that are you receiving SSI because you don't have enough work credits built into the system yet. So you may be receiving SSI and working. It's just you do not have enough of those work credits built up right. into the system yet to receive SSDI. So then you then what happens is once you start building that up, like you said in 2016, you've been working and your income has increased substantially. And so now you're receiving SSDI. Um, that is needs-based. And that is because you are now if you remember, you're paying the FICA tax out of your um, payroll every mm -hmm. every month. So that money gets put into that fund. And so when you need it, you're essentially just drawing back out of your safe fund. It goes into a big pot federally because um, SSDI is a federal program and SSI is state funded. Does, yeah. does that answer your question? Kind of, uh, kind of, uh, and I guess because the second, that's the second part of the question, I guess, uh, because uh, I lost recently my social security income uh, completely because, because my SGA has been high for a while, right? Over, over the 36 months threshold. Yep. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, does that 36 month apply only if you were on and off receiving uh, money over the SGA or does that apply even if you were constantly receiving that for, the, for those 36 months? No, that would just be over um, the- or nine months. Yes for your income on SGA. Yeah, you were over SGA for those months. Um, and so that is why those have stopped. Um, and one of the other things that Jose is talking about is he mentioned here, um, the state of Colorado has what is called um, Medicaid buy-in for working adults. Um, and it is a great, great program here in the state of Colorado. I wish every single state had it, um, but I'm extremely proud to say that we have an amazing um, program for working adults. And that is for those who um, aren't familiar with, I'll touch on it just, just briefly here. It is a program. So if you are receiving SS, um, or receiving Medicaid at any point in time um, and you start working, what happens is then you need to apply for what is called the um, Medicaid buy-in for working adults. Because then Social Security says you're no longer um, 
disabled. Receiving, right, you're receiving those benefits, but we still wanna allow you the opportunity to buy into the Medicaid program at an extremely, extremely low rate, which is based off of the federal poverty limit. And how that is determined is Social Security, excuse me, Medicaid, Medicaid um, looks at your income and they take about 65% of it. And that is the amount that they look at to determine um, where you fall in that federal poverty limit and how much your premium is. Um, so an individual um, can be working um, and be able to utilize the buy-in program and not have to pay a premium or it may be a $25 premium or a $90 premium. The max premium an individual would ever pay on the buy-in program is $200. Now, if an individual is paying $200, their income still is extremely high. That is about making $9,600 a month and you can still qualify to receive Medicaid. Now, the last time I spoke with Beverly uh, from Sick Pop, uh, she said that it was 50% that they calculated. Um, actually, I'm, if I can jump in here, we actually have the uh, recordings of the two um, Medicaid buy-in sessions that we did okay. um, available on our website, Jose, um, okay. along okay. with the, the documentation and everything, if you want to take a look at it. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and you can go out to HickBuff's website too and you know plug in Medicaid buy and then it'll show you the whole calculation. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Jennifer Peck, you have two questions if you wanna unmute yourself. And um, the, her first question was, I was told by SSA that I can't earn more than 1190 a month or I'll lose my SSDI or have to pay them back. Is that true? And do we have to pay income tax? on SSI, SSCI. Okay, so um, first of all, great question. Um, if you remember at the beginning of my presentation when I was talking about um, SSDI and SGA, Social Security looks at SGA when they're determining um, whether an individual can keep their benefits or not. And that changes every single year. So the amount that you are talking about, the 1110, I think you said? 1110, uh, 11, okay. 1190. That was for 2019, I believe, um, because last year was was 1290. Um, so it increases every single year. So it, it all comes down to uh, how much you are making and are you over SGA? So for example, if an individual is um, making $1,400 gross, but we have a $100 work incentive, which is what we're going to talk about. That reduces your gross income to countable earnings. And that is what Social Security looks at. Mm -hmm. They would say this individual is then still under SGA and her benefits are not affected. I think that makes sense. Okay, all right. <laughs> so for, for 2020, the limit was 1290, if you remember correctly. And for 2021 it was it's it's yep it's increased it's one thousand three hundred and ten dollars okay all right and um but any amount that i make i still have to report to hhs right yes okay yep. you were going to re report your wages uh to any um, service provider, whether that's Social Security, whether that's SNAP, whether if you're receiving a housing voucher, um, you have to report to all of those entities. Yes. Got it. I don't. I don't get SNAP anymore because they took. They counted my SSDI as income. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that I, I, I couldn't get it anymore. And then um, I have. Um, I I don't need housing assistance because we bought the the home with money from the settlement, from the car accident. Okay. Um, I've worked very little um, in the past couple of years, just doing a little bit of massage, but I did find out about the buy-in program and 
I I have an appointment later with my a DVR counselor. Very good. So um, would the but the DVR counselor is not the same as a benefit specialist. No, no, not at all, not at all. Um, you actually have to be certified to be a benefits planner, but you have to go through DVR. So when you're talking with your DVR counselor today, um, let them know that, hey, um, I'd really like to get some benefits planning done because of work and I wanna know how it's going to affect my cash benefits. Mm -hmm. And then your um, DVR counselor um, can reach out to me. They'll send me a referral and authorization. Okay. And then you and I will work together. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds good. Um, and then my other question was just about, are we taxed on our benefits as income? Um, I want to know that too. <laughs> so I'm just going to pre preface that question with, I am not a an accountant or tax accountant. Okay. Um, so I, I really do. I know, I know a little bit, um, but I always, always refer um, clients if they have tax questions to seek an, a tax attorney or tax accountant to kind of verify that because there are some instances, if you're receiving just social security, you don't have to report those earnings mm -hmm. and you don't have to file taxes. Mm -hmm. So, and every single situation is different. So I would highly recommend you seek out the um, expertise in that. Okay, and if you have anybody that you recommend or refer, that would be great to know. Yep, I can certainly do that. And same thing too, if there's anybody out there that is um, has questions on how to save money or put money into these certain accounts, whether it's a trust account or an ABLE account, I always refer all of my um, estate and trust questions to Chris Brock, who is the, the legal expertise at CCDC, so. Okay, and then like him. Chris <laughs> Brock at CCDC, yeah. Chris Brock with a B, B-R-O-C-K. -E Brock, got it, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Elizabeth Shaparo, uh, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself. She says, hello, I'm a care coordinator at St. Anthony North Family Medicine. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know uh, who I can connect our patients with to go over the information, explain benefits. Um, we get a lot of questions and I don't feel qualified to teach or talk to us. Very good. Um, so again, like I said at the very beginning, it's always, always important if somebody has questions about work and social security to reach out or get those services for a benefits planner because we are certified. Um, and as we all know, Social Security language is very convoluted and very hard to understand. Um, so reach out to, if that individual is working with a DDR counselor. So my first question to that client would be, are you receiving services through DVR? If you are not receiving those services through DVR, I would highly recommend that you connect, get connected with your local DVR office. They'll do an intake and get you all set up. And then they refer those clients back out to um, our agency. Uh, so then that's how we, get, that's how you get connected with that benefits planner is through working with DVR. Or if you don't wanna work with DVR and you have enough money set aside and you do private pay, we can work with you individually and then you just, um, separately. Um, she was having uh, audio issues, so I'm not sure if she can answer. So um, I told her if she didn't get the answer, I'll we'll get that okay. to her. So um, and then real quickly, Dawn uh, just wanted to point out that we do have a webinar about ABLE accounts scheduled for August. So. Oh, great. Yeah. Cindy Stevens, I'm going to have you ask your own question because I don't understand it at all. <laughs> Hi there. Um, going back to the disabled adult child benefit. So the parent is going to retire. I understand the um, adult disabled child could claim against that parent. And just for example purposes, say it's $1,000 a month is the 50% of the parent FRA, full retirement age benefit. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, I, I thought that meant then the adult disabled child will get both the 794 benefit plus the difference like 206 for a full social security amount of $1,000 per month, assuming, you know, they're not working or, or whatever that might be that they still qualify for that 794. Is that true? You are on the right track. Um, what you touched upon is social security retirement benefits. Yes. And that is not part of typically SSDI. That's the other category. If you remember, there were those two columns. Um, and because your payment changes once you have reached full or even half retirement age, because you can retire early and mm -hmm. receive half of that, which is what you were talking about, that 50%. Or if, if you yourself or an individual waits till full retirement, then that changes. The retirement benefits are a little bit different than what we're talking about here. Okay, and I guess just to clarify again, I thought the disabled adult child would still have like a portion of SSDI and mm -hmm. the balance as the retirement. Yeah, and, and quite honestly, correct. Social Security doesn't answer these questions very well. Exactly. No, so you, that, yeah. you are correct. And um, I'll throw my contact information in the chat too. It's at the end of the presentation, but or and if you have that, if you'll throw it in the chat for me, that would be great. Thank you. Um, feel free to reach out and you know give me a call and we can have that conversation offline. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we just have a few more minutes. Will, Matt, will you talk about what you're gonna do in the second half of the presentation? And I'm gonna put the link in the chat so people can go and register for that. Mm -hmm. Remember, you gotta register for the second one just because, you know, tech. Um, if you want to continue hearing uh, about um, or hearing Chantel's, uh, hi, yeah, if you want to come back and learn more. <laughs> yes, please come back because the second half really goes even deeper into how you can work more than 20 hours a week and still receive your benefits. So I pulled back up this slide um, to our iceberg and down here it talks about work incentives. And this is really what the rest of the presentation is. It's based on work incentives. And that is covering, again, a little bit of that trial work period. Um, but it also covers past plans, um, which very briefly, that is just if an individual um, is, wants to work for themselves, self-employment, or even going back to school, we can write a past plan which helps them um, get a few more deductions. There's a student earned income exclusion. So if you have an individual who is a student, um, there is an ex earned income exclusion we can take. There's also a subsidy and special conditions. That briefly is um, if an individual is working at a job and they, we kind of have to specialize their job duties or they're doing something just a little bit different um, or modifying um, job roles. That can be considered as a subsidy or special condition. Also inside that includes items like job coaching. If we have a client that is out working and they need assistance through job coaching, um, we can take the expense of that job coaching and reduce um, their income um, to lower their countable earnings. And then again, those impairment related work expenses. Those are any out of pocket work expenses an individual needs to be able to go to work, i.e. prescription. If you pay out of pocket for any prescriptions, we can use that because you need to still take your meds even though you're working. Um, if you're working someplace and there, it requires a special uniform, those expenses we can use, or travel expenses. If you have a unique travel situation, for example, uh, you, you aren't able to access um, a Cessna ride here, which is our Medicaid transportation, and you need to take an Uber or a Lyft to and from work, we can use some of those expenses to reduce your gross earnings, um, which also lowers your countable earnings. So, that is what we are really going to focus on the second half, um, which if you are on this call, I would highly, highly recommend 
um, you register for that second half. And I just, it's, it's April 26, 10 a.m. So same time, same bat channel, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and uh, I also put your uh, email in there as well, Chantel. Very good. Yep. Thank you. That takes us right up to the hour. So um, thank you so much. Uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, you're uh, giving a presentation for us today. And um, for those who have been asking, I've been answering, but the recording and the PowerPoint will be available on our website. Um, I'm just going to go. It'll be available on the website. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then uh, the second part will be available after that. So, anything else that's hypercritical? That uh, if not, that's it. Thank Thanks, you, guys. Thanks, Chantel. Uh -huh. Bye bye. Bye.